In the name of the light, I bless you. May the light flow through you and keep you from corruption and sin. Our victory is prophesied in the heavens. Long before the Cathedral of Light was filled with zealous followers practicing rites of bloody repentance for Big Daddy and Arius, the Cathedral was founded as a response to the insidious intentions of Hell seeking to sway humanity against the heavens. And to truly grasp the essence of the Cathedral of Light, we need to make a journey back in time. Let's go back roughly 3,000 years prior to the current events of Diablo IV, all the way to the tumultuous period known as the Sin War. Hi everyone, I'm Nyx, and I write lore videos on the Diablo universe and its many characters and stories. Welcome to this deep dive into the origins of the Cathedral of Light. If you like this video, please leave me a like. If you love it, a subscription would be much appreciated. Stick to the end or check out the chapters in the description to hear my thoughts on the similarities between the Cathedral of Light and Christianity. Now that's out of the way, let's get started. In the throes of the Sin War, a mysterious organization rose from the shadows, the Cathedral of Light. This temple of faith was conceived and orchestrated by none other than Anirius the Archangel, who built the church in order to counterbalance the machinations of the Triune and their endeavor to captivate humanity. Inarius could not allow such a shift in power. The Cathedral of Light's presence was consolidated to a single monumental structure, a citadel located north of Kerjan. This was unlike the Triune, who propagated their hellish cult in scattered temples and churches across the world. The cathedral's singularity, its allure, lay in its centralized power, one grand institution symbolizing unity against the pervasive evil. This serene monument bore an unseen façade. It was not merely a shelter for the weary, rather it was a tapestry of strategic deception. The cathedral was a countermeasure, crafted to combat the influence of the Triune and their unspoken mission to win over the hearts and minds of humanity. As we journey further into the recesses of the cathedral's lore in the next few minutes, let us never forget its clandestine origins, a sanctuary conceived in a time of secret strife, born out of a necessity to wrest control from an insidious enemy. The Cathedral of Light, while a symbol of hope in those times, is forever marked by the shadow of the Sin War. A struggle that would inexorably link humanity to the ongoing battle between angels and demons forever. The Cathedral of Light held a doctrine that was both simple and complex. At the center of this belief structure stood the Prophet. That's our boy Inarius. A figure who personified wisdom and benevolence, leading the congregation for centuries, far exceeding a regular human lifespan. The faithful placed their trust in the prophet. Indeed, Inarius took the form of a common mortal and his followers were drawn to his calm demeanor, ageless beauty and enduring strength. He was an embodiment of the ideal to which they all aspired. Their admiration for the prophet was so deep-rooted that they accepted him as something beyond human, even though they did not know that he was in fact an angel. Interestingly, the concept of angels was not a central part of the cathedral's doctrine. The prophet was the paramount figure, yes, the source of their spiritual guidance, the embodiment of their faith. Inarius, the true leader and the angel in disguise, had some artwork of angels in his personal quarter, but it was unclear if his followers ever understood the significance or simply saw them as products of an artist's imagination. Despite the angelic undertones, the belief structure of the Cathedral of Light was not built around the worship of a supreme being back then. Instead, it was a doctrine that underscored the prophet's teaching and his wisdom, guiding people on how to live their lives, a path illuminated by the light of the cathedral. This faith was not just about worship, it was about living a life in the prophet's footsteps, aspiring to attain his wisdom and inner peace. Contrary to the bitter Inarius we know from Diablo 4, this Inarius seemed more mellow, but Inarius being Inarius, he had some hidden plans. By the way, if you want to hear more about Inarius, I have a full video about him. Link in the top right of your screen. The Cathedral of Light as a religious institution was structured with a hierarchy that was both robust and efficient. At the apex of this structure stood the prophet Inarius. Underneath the prophet serving him directly were two leading priests, 
They were the chosen ones, trusted by the prophet to disseminate his teachings and wisdom amongst the congregation. These priests were more than just the spiritual leaders, they were the extensions of the prophet himself. His voice amplified through their dedication and would make important tactical decisions on his behalf. Further down the ranks there were priests and missionaries, the torchbearers of the cathedral's faith, responsible for spreading its doctrines. Their mission was not confined to the cathedral's grand structure in Kajan. They ventured beyond the grasslands across vast territories, striving to convert more hearts to the path of the prophet, which often led to their death. A small price to pay for the church, even back in those days. The defense of these devoted missionaries and the cathedral itself fell to the hands of the inquisitors. These were the devoted warriors of the cathedral, armed with unwavering faith and ironclad resolve. They protected the priests on their journey, safeguarding the faith against external threats. This organizational structure was the backbone of the Cathedral of Light. It was a network of belief, connecting the faithful to the divine teachings of the Prophet, and thereby to Inarius himself. And behind this complex network, Inarius stood as the conductor, orchestrating the symphony of faith that resonated throughout Sanctuary. Beneath the serene and loving facade of Inarius, he hid his own motives. His disciples, full of admiration and reverence for him, were unaware that they were being subtly manipulated for his hidden agenda. Inarius's intention was not about fostering spiritual growth amongst his followers. Instead, he sought to exert control over Sanctuary so that the High Heavens could use that control over the forces of Hell. His followers unknowingly turned into his personal army devoted to him and willing to fight for his cause. Inaris had his followers working tirelessly to spread his influence across Sanctuary. They were driven by their faith, not knowing that their efforts were actually contributing to his personal desires and not their spiritual enrichment. Amid the cataclysmic turmoil of the Sin War, an unsuspecting farmer, Odysseus, found himself thrust into the fray between the religious factions of the Triune and the Cathedral of Light. This unexpected twist of fate occurred when Lilith, escaping her imprisonment in the Void, unveiled Odysseus's latent Nephilim powers. Her ultimate intention was to manipulate him as a pawn against the High Heavens and the Deep Depth of Hell. Motivated by their newfound power, Odysseus and his followers founded the Edirim, a group committed to dismantling the oppressive reign of both the Triune and the Cathedral. Their efforts, however, drew the attention of the High Heavens who became aware of both Sanctuary and its human inhabitants. The Edirim succeeded in shattering the Triune and the Cathedral of Light, banishing Lilith back into the Void and modifying the World Stone to lift Inaris's suppressive shroud over humanity's potential. Nonetheless, their actions incited the High Heavens to invade Sanctuary, motivated by their desire to extinguish what they perceived as the abomination of humanity. The Burning Hells followed suit, leading to a tripartite clash between the Heavenly Host, Demonic Legion, and the Edirim. The final confrontation between the High Heavens, Burning Hells, and the Edirim culminated in the devastating obliteration of this once revered institution. And the faith of its followers endured an unprecedented trial. But the downfall of the Cathedral was far from the end. Inarius, the mind behind the Cathedral, confronted a harsh destiny. After a pact between heaven and hell, Mephisto, the father of Lilith, ensnared Inarius and condemned him to perpetual torment in hell. As the remnants of the Cathedral of Light lay in ruin, Inarius's cult receded into obscurity, holding out hope for their divine father's return. The faith never completely vanished. A small gathering of believers continued to worship in secrecy, yearning for their angel's return. The belief in Inarius' return was handed down through generations rooted in the firm conviction that he would return someday. And indeed, he did. A few years before the events of Diablo IV, Inarius, despite his past misdeeds, re-emerges on Sanctuary. Having survived centuries of torture by Mephisto, Inarius comes back transformed for the worst. Bitter towards humanity, he only sees in them the opportunity for redemption in the face of the high heavens. His return marked the revival of the Cathedral of Light, breathing new life into the fallen establishment. Inaris's aim, though ambitious, was singular, redemption. 
he aspired to reclaim his place amongst the high heavens, a home he'd been exiled from long ago. His return to Sanctuary was driven by a newfound resolve to once again manipulate humanity for his own gains. Evidence of Inaris's renewed endeavor was found in an unlikely item, the Gloves of the Illuminator. Quote, After Inaris returned to Sanctuary, he sought a way back to the High Heavens. His first step was to reignite the religion he had abandoned millennia before, the Cathedral of Light. I saw my corpse and from my mouth crawled hatred. A father burned his children on a pyre and a mother molded a new age from the ashes. I saw the weak made strong, a pack of lambs feasting on wolves. Tears of blood rained on a desert jewel, and the way to hell was torn asunder. Then came a spear of light, piercing hatred's heart, and he who was bound in chains was set free. Ratma's Prophecy The prophecy, bearing Ratma's name, originates from him, the child of Inaris and Lilith. A portion of this prophecy was utilized by Inaris to rekindle the Cathedral of Light. Let's dissect it a bit further. I saw my corpse. Spoiler alert, I'm going to be spoiling Act 1. This is quite straightforward. By the conclusion of Act 1, Ratma meets his end. And from my mouth crawled hatred. The word hatred is an allegory for Mephisto. A father burned his children on a pyre. This speaks to Inaris establishing his Cathedral of Light and promoting its self-destructive practices, utilizing humanity to augment his own power. The pyre is both symbolic, referring to the church's persecution and execution of those deemed sinners, and quite literal as the priest in Margrave maintains a pyre at the town's center where he burns sinners alive. And a mother molded a new age from the ashes. From the church's ashes, the persecuted, the martyrs, ascended to a new era, the era of Lilith. I saw the weak made strong. This most likely points to the Wanderer, that's you by the way, and their evolution from a typical adventurer to a heroic figure through the campaign. Then came a spear of light, piercing hatred's heart. Consumed by his boundless pride, Inarius is under the delusion that this refers to his own victory over Lilith. Regardless of his belief, he propagates this part of the prophecy amongst his followers, promising them salvation from darkness and demons and pledging to drive the spear of light into the heart of hatred. From the Father's voice to my ears, a spear of light piercing hatred's heart. First Lilith, then the Prime. He will deliver us from the eternal conflict. The Cathedral of Light seized this prophecy, interpreting it as a divine message that justifies their harsh and fanatic actions. They believed that Inarius must emerge victorious and return to the High Heavens. In their perspective, the Spear of Light signifies Inarius and Hatred's heart, Lilith. The Cathedral of Light held a specific view on humanity, characterized by the belief in an inherent sinfulness that requires redemption. This was depicted in the lore surrounding Vigo's protecting amulet, an artifact with a description that reflects the church's doctrine. Quote, Through penance alone, so we let the Father's light enter our sinful souls. Lay down your life for his purpose, and you shall shine brilliantly with his glory. At the heart of the cathedral's doctrine was a strong emphasis on repentance. The idea was simple but daunting. All of humanity had committed sins and had fallen from grace, and the path to salvation lay in acknowledging this fact and seeking redemption. Does that sound familiar to you, or is that just me? This philosophy wasn't merely an abstract concept, it was practiced fervently within the cathedral and its followers. One such practice was the communal witnessing of sin's wages. This typically involved public pyres, where the repercussions of sin were made manifest for all to see. The process was intended to demonstrate the dire consequences of living a sinful life and to serve as a reminder of the necessity of repentance. The imagery of public pyres and the constant emphasis on sin might appear harsh, even cruel. However, 
From the perspective of the cathedral, these methods were seen as necessary measures in their mission of spiritual guidance. The goal was to guide the people towards salvation, a path that they believed could only be achieved through an acknowledgement of one's sin and the earnest pursuit of redemption before the Father Inarius. The village of Margrave has a notice board that says, Citizens and pilgrims of Margrave, at the toll of the bell, all men, women and children must assemble around the pyre. Together we bear witness to the wages of sin. The Cathedral of Light had a clear stance on art, which notably resulted in the destruction of many pre-existing cathedrals prior to the institution's rise. The church's dogma, with its emphasis on penitence and the inherent sinfulness of humanity, regarded art as a distraction from the spiritual journey towards redemption. This perspective was solidified during the events of the Better Days side quest, a mission that further showcased the church's critical views of art. This painting must be from before my mother's time. These days, art like this would just go into the pyre. I'll have to keep this well hidden. The quest revealed how art, particularly that which existed before the rise of the cathedral, was considered a threat to the institution's influence and its doctrines. In many ways, the destruction of art served as a symbolic assertion of the cathedral's dominance and a direct rejection of the past. By eliminating these symbols of the pre-cathedral era, the institution sought to remove any remnants of the past that could contradict or undermine their doctrine. However, this stance on art also carried a more practical purpose, control. Art, in all its forms, has the power to inspire, provoke, and shape thoughts. By controlling the artistic narrative, the cathedral was able to further cement its doctrine and maintain its influence over the populace. It's important to note here that the destruction of art wasn't an isolated act of aggression against culture, but was a part of a larger strategy employed by the cathedral to solidify its hold over sanctuary. The destruction of historical art and architecture served as an effective tool in the cathedral's endeavors to shape the spiritual and cultural landscape according to its vision. The Cathedral of Light is not a singular entity but a congregation of dedicated members each playing their part to propagate the doctrine of the prophet. Let's start this chapter by talking about the right hand of Inaris himself, Rava. Rava, the high priestess, is a figure of immense reverence within the church. With a commanding presence and a voice that carries the weight of authority, she is regarded as the spiritual guide for the members of the cathedral. She is fire of faith personified. Her devoted allegiance with Inarius defines her actions, guiding her service to the cathedral and its congregation. Rava started her religious journey years after the inception of the church when Inarius appeared in her home and healed her from deadly seizures. From that moment on, she became his faithful servant and guides the church and its zealous priests. The Pale Knights represent a different aspect of the church's operations. These individuals are defenders of its faith. They are seen as the stalwart protectors of the doctrine, dedicating their lives to preserving the sanctity of the cathedral. Their loyalty to Inaris and the cathedral is unyielding, and their service marked by their dedication and strength. Their tasks vary, often tied to the security and defense of the cathedral's interests, but always their role is to serve as the cathedral's staunch protectors, carrying out their duties with a zeal that was born from their faith. Spoiler warning, I'm going to be spoiling the ending of Diablo 4, so if you haven't finished the game, please do not go any further. But make sure to come back once you finish the game. That would be fantastic, thank you. All right, let's start. Act six draws to a close as Anarius of the Cathedral of Light descends into the depth of hell. Motivated by a potent prophecy, he harbors an unyielding determination to annihilate Lilith and gain redemption. His ultimate aim is to return to the sanctity of the high heavens, a consequence of his regret for the creation of sanctuary. As he engages in a tense confrontation with Lilith, Inarius reveals his sole objective, to kill her, thereby earning his ticket back to the celestial sphere. Lilith, however, turns the table by toying with his desperation. She informs him, to his disbelief, that his pleas to the high heavens are going unnoticed. She then deliberately allows him to wound her. With a hopeful heart, Inarius reaches for the heavens. His cries echo unanswered signaling that his efforts have yet to be deemed enough. 
As he grapples with this disheartening revelation, Lilith seizes the opportunity to strike back. She impales him with his own spear and brutally rips off his wings. The consequences are grave. Benarius is dead, and the formidable forces of the Cathedral of Light are decimated. Prava, the esteemed High Priestess of the Cathedral, is left critically injured and abandoned on the battlefield. Though she survives this catastrophic event, she bears a grudge against the Horadrim and Lorath specifically for Inarius' downfall. With the loss of their divine leader, the future of the Cathedral of Light hangs in the balance, shrouded in uncertainty. The Cathedral of Light, its structure, doctrine, and history certainly draw parallels with real-world religious institutions. In particular, its hierarchical structure and theological foundations can be compared to those of Christianity, albeit with stark differences. The Cathedral of Light, like Christianity, operates with a defined hierarchical system. At the top of the hierarchy is the prophet, who resembles the Pope in the Catholic belief, leading and guiding the religious practices of the Cathedral. Below the prophet are the high priestesses and pale knights, comparable to bishops and priests who serve their communities under the Pope's guidance. Although, I've yet to see a priest in a full suit of plate armor. Could be cool though. The cathedral's doctrine, focusing on repentance and redemption, has similarities with Christian beliefs. Christianity emphasizes the concept of sin and the need for redemption, with the belief in Jesus Christ's sacrifice, offering salvation to humankind. Similarly, the cathedral preaches about humanity's inherent sinfulness and the need for penance, with Inarius presenting himself as the beacon of this redemption, of course. However, significant differences lie within the intention and actions of the cathedral's leadership, specifically Inarius. Unlike Christian leaders, who generally seek to guide their congregation towards spiritual growth and salvation, Inaris's motivations are rooted in self-interest, manipulation, and control. Moreover, the narrative techniques and lore building in the Jamlo universe create a distinct separation from real-world religions, of course. The tales of battle between angels and demons, the Sin War, and the existence of Sanctuary itself represent a complex fantasy universe that goes beyond the scope of traditional religious teachings. Although it's not far off, the story of the cathedral offers a metaphorical lesson that extends beyond the game world. It serves as a reminder of the potential for manipulation within any power structure, including religious institution, and the importance of critical thinking and questioning to avoid blind adherence. It is also a call to recognize the difference between leaders who genuinely care for their followers' spiritual well-being and those who exploit faith for personal gain. This insight resonates not only within the fantastical realm of Sanctuary, but also in the real world, adding a layer of relevance to the captivating lore of the Diablo universe. Mm -hmm.